What's up, guys? Welcome back to the My First Property podcast. And today we have like we've met the second time. Yeah. The first time we met in Pavilion, and instantly we clicked really well. I assume lah, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is like one sided. I yeah. think why we clicked so well is uh, because we both have the same passion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is around property. Which is like mm. we try to make this happen since last year. But her schedule is so busy because I'm just a domestic investor. She's an international investor from Singapore. So, uh, you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Hi, everybody. My name is Chu Yu. So, I'm from Singapore and I'm a property investor and an entrepreneur in the property space. Cool. From Singapore. Yes. And that is a whole creature of investment on its own, right? Nothing like Malaysia. And I think let's start there straight away because lately one of my videos gone viral. Which one? The one that I talked about, JB property drop value. Uh-huh. So a lot of Singaporeans, right, who thought about investing in Malaysia suddenly, eh, Malaysia like that cannot lo. But that's JB ma, invest in KL. La. <laughs> invest in somewhere else in Malaysia. We yeah. still got chance. Yep, yep, exactly. So, first of all, like, why are you here in Malaysia? Hey, I'm here in, <laughs> um, I'm here in Malaysia on a work business trip. So, uh, my business here in Singapore is revolves around property investment. Mm. We teach about property investment, how to, uh, people, how should people start property investment to, you know, grow their wealth in Singapore. And at the same time, I also have, uh, runs a property agency to help people buy, sell their property. Lah. And we focus on helping investors, not just people who want to buy homes for own stay. We focus more for helping uh, investors who want to invest and grow their portfolio, whether it's in Singapore or in overseas property, especially, say, UK property market. Mm-hmm. Cool. Like, never have I ever thought about investing overseas. One. Yeah, and this is a very... I would say Singaporeans need to start thinking mm. like that, okay? Because uh, I think the difference between Singaporean investors and Malaysian investors is that in Singapore, right, if you own a residential property, if you want to own the second residential property, mm. you have to pay a very, very high additional buyer stamp duty. So after owning one residential property, your second residential property will cost you a tax of 17%. So if you buy second property at one million dollars sing, uh, the tax will be tax is hundred and seventy thousand, which could be a down payment for another property somewhere else mm. already. So it just doesn't logically make sense for Singaporean to own more than one residential property in Singapore. So I think that if Singaporean wants to start exploring property investment, they have to open up their mindset to look at properties that is not in Singapore or in the commercial space in mm. Singapore. Yeah. Then like, what's the main... Okay, just treat me like a newbie of the Singapore landscape. Mm. When, when the, the worst thing is like now, like we just shared that I'm getting sponsored to Singapore for a trip, right? And the fear is when Singaporeans come to me, hey, is this BTO? Do you think you should buy a like? Like, BTO is what also? I'm not sure. Can you like? So BTO stands for built to order. Mm. Uh, so built to order, basically they are the government sub- heavily subsidized house. So I think what the Singapore government did very well in the past few years in terms of housing mm. plan for the locals is that I would say, I think 90 plus percent of Singaporeans are homeowners, uh, yeah. right? And why are they able to be a homeowners is because the government make it such that uh, Singaporeans can buy government property and these properties are generally very heavily subsidized and mm. so uh, if let's say two two person get married they buy the house surely can afford most of the time uh, especially if they are using their CPF to yeah. pay off the, the mortgage and whatnot for your information yeah. CPF is our EBF la. yeah the exactly. retirement one la. yeah so I would say back to the question if people ask you hey should buy BTO or not uh, my question would be a few things are like uh, so what? good I met you now before the trip. Yeah, that question, right? <laughs> so, uh, I think mostly need to understand what's the main difference between buying into a HDB and a private property, which mm. we call the condominiums, right? Is that uh, if you guys are starting out 
as a young couple, um, HDB, you need to buy with like get married one. Uh. Private cannot buy. Private, you can buy individual person name. Mm. So if you have the intention uh, to get married, then go for BTO. Otherwise, you cannot buy BTOs because the BTO is meant for couples, right? Okay. If you don't have a partner, then you cannot go for BTO anyways. Mm. You have to go for private lah. Does it applies to gays and lesbians also? In Singapore, cannot. Cannot lah. So it's not recognized. Yeah, not recognized. Uh, if I'm not wrong, they could. If they are above 35 years old, mm. then they could buy together as like occupier oh. partners. But before 35 years old, they cannot buy BTO. BTO is uh, like brand new. Yeah, so the government houses, which is called HDB, there is a BTO, which means it's brand new. And there is also the resale market. The old ones. Yeah, the old ones. Uh. Yeah. Like my brother and my sister-in-law, now they are in Singapore. Mm. So like throughout their entire years of knowing my sister-in-law there, right? Their whole conversation and focus is only to own a HDB. Leh. They are PR, right? Yeah. So, uh, PR and PR in Singapore, they buy property, they still need to buy, pay additional 5% stamp duty. Mm. So, which also means that uh, buying a H- BTO or HDB in Singapore will be much more affordable. Mm. And if you are looking for a homestay somewhere where you want to have a roof above your head and uh, generally good condition, right? I think it's perfectly fine to just go for BTO. Okay, uh, if you are looking for flipping, that means to make a lot of money from property, then that's another yeah. story because then it will depend on, because HDB is 99 year leasehold. Mm. If you buy a very old one, then you can naturally expect that the price will start to depreciate, yeah. right? Uh, so it, it boils down to what is the purpose of them buying into the house mm. and what is their current asset. If you are brand new, just started out work, both of you, you and your girlfriend just started out work, then go for BTO is okay. Kickstart your property investment journey. Or I wouldn't say I would even call it like investment journey. Ownership journey. Yes. Kickstart your property ownership journey. Mm. Then after you stay there for five years for HDB, you can sell it off. And by the time, if let's say your income is higher, you can take on more loan. Then you consider jumping into the private mm. uh, sector. Lah. But kickstarting that property ownership journey is actually quite good. Yeah. yeah. To let time build the equity for you. Exactly. And... What is the loan financing like in Singapore? Loan financing, uh, okay. Uh, so, <laughs> like, suddenly, <laughs> so, not, not, not sad <laughs> lah, because uh, there's like a difference uh, between uh, private mm. property versus uh, government property. Mm. And there is also between government loan versus bank loan. Mm. Okay. okay. So if you buy a HDB, which is government house, you can choose to take bank loan or government HDB loan. And... That would affect, uh, okay, if you take the HDB loan, then the maximum loan you can get is 80%. 80%? Down payment is 20%. Oh. Your, your reaction is what? Means it's Res- high. high, high uh. You know, last time it used to be 90% and 10% down payment for government. Mm. Because uh, recently they just changed the cooling, add, add in this cooling measure to, to control you know, the people keep buying, keep buying it. Yeah. Correct, and the HDB prices are going crazy. Do you know yeah. some HDB went up to millions of million, eh, past the million mark when it's supposed to be subs- government yeah. subsidized house, so it went up to million mark, million dollar mark. So, uh, yeah, if you go for uh HDB, you can choose to go for HDB loan on private bank loan. So if it's a private bank loan, the maximum loan is seventy five percent. So twenty five percent must be cash, cash, uh, down payment, mm. right, right, uh, cash plus CPF. So out of the twenty five percent, right? Okay, okay. Maximum twenty percent they can use their CPF to pay for the house, and minimum at least five percent must be cash. Yeah. So if you have been working in Singapore to couple build up sufficient in your CPF account, actually it's still quite uh possible to buy property in Singapore. I would say. Yeah, because CPF is part of the thing. Then it's not like you can opt out, right? So. Yeah. Exactly. So my point is, if any, some people are so. Uh, worry about using CPF. They want to save their CPF for their retirement. Mm. The thing is, this CPF sitting in your CPF account is not. You you can't take it out in cash at this moment in time, and you could earn a higher interest rate at four percent if you shift it into say the retirement account. But the point is, you could actually earn more if you use it mm. or property invest property yeah. purchase exactly. right. So 
my suggestion is that if you have CPF money, just use your CPF money. Anyway, you cannot use it for other things. Just use it to buy property. La. Yeah. If not, it's sitting there and do nothing. Let your money work harder for you. Yes, exactly. And these are money that you really don't see. Mm. Right. Yeah. Then renovation and got loan or not? Your? Got loan. Wow, renovation loan. There is renovation loan. Of course, let's say couple get married, they buy the house already. They can they want to renovate the house. They can go to a bank to take a renovation loan. However, in Singapore, there's this thing this thing called the total debt servicing ratio. Mm. So total debt servicing ratio will will say that right. Okay, out of your entire income, you can only use how many percentage to take on debt. Mm. For example, mortgage debt is calculated, uh, renovation debt, and a car loan, and all these things are put together. So this will affect how much loan you can take, right? So I think in Singapore right now, the total debt servicing ratio is 55%, which means let's say you earn $10,000, you can only use 5005 to pay for, say, mortgage plus uh, hey, that's true. 20. Yeah, very good. Hey, but this is very good. You yeah, know why? Yeah, very healthy. It's a very... um. I would say very precautionary measure by the government to make sure that the locals don't over leverage. Yeah. In the case of, say, recession, and then people lose their job, they are... Not as ganjong. Not as ganjong. You are right. So, I mean, these are some... Worse is off the charts. La. <laughs> what do you mean by off the chart? Like, could they over leverage? We things? can over leverage. Yes, Bank Negara has laid out a lot. Like, Bank Negara is extremely strict with loan application. That applies to M40, B40 people. Like the T20s, right? The more money you have, right? You can go 110%, right? No what? question asked. Me? 110%, you can buy money, buy property with no money down, plus still get 10% of the property price put into your pocket. So they pay you to buy property. It's like, that's a DSR. Means that if I got, if I'm earning, made, let's say, 30,000, yeah. I can pay loans up to 40,000, right? Then how do they expect them to pay with the addition? Yeah, we start. You have FDs. You have investment here, investment there. Then we can then like like uh rental income can also be declared as income, right? Ah uh, yes. Uh so so that is the to add on to the DSR. So I think it's the same game, lah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, also I think like that's why in Malaysia right with the two ninety percent slot and we have one hundred percent loan one. One hundred percent. <laughs> I think we buy a property, right? It's 100% loan. Eh. That's damn good, why, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but what does it mean about the quality of the uh, build? Does it affect like uh, how how people see the economy in terms of property in the market? Um, Two ways to look at it. Like now, I think Malaysia has the highest FDI performance this, this junction of time. La. Then I... C property ownership is a very heavy element of politics. Like every single government, right? Oh, we need to build cheaper houses. More Malaysians need to own properties or whatsoever. The more they push, right? Guess who owns more? Property yeah. invest. Yes. Yeah. So now, it's like heaven. And if you now still cannot afford, right? Like the DSR thing, it's very strict against like people who makes like three to four thousand bucks. Like the fifty five percent, sixty percent, it's heavily applied on them. So they, it's very challenging for them to get loans. But if you're earning more than that, really, like I'm in that position, uh, right? Like bankers call me, like you got, you want more loan or not? We can offer you. You go find property, lah. When actually the initial intention was to help more people buy house and have home ownership, but right now only the richer ones can afford to buy more and more properties, while the not so high earning ones will. Just struggling to own the same one. Yeah. Difficulty to even get the first property. Yeah. Right? Okay. So that's the whole intention of what I do. Like, all, it's, it's beyond average people's imagination for one person to own like 20, 25 properties. Right? How do you actually do that? And after doing this for a while, right, I meet a lot of uncle, uncle holding Ikea back, go and with a bunch of keys. One, uh. So they show me, oh, this project, I got like six. Or oh, what do you mean six? Six units. I uh. know the level six is mine. Hey, that day, right, I was uh, on the plane flying over to KL mm. and sitting beside me was also this uncle. Mm. Then he just chit-chat with me and then he realised that I'm also inside the property space. Then he started to share with me, uh, mm. he is a developer, mm. small, small-scale small developer but still developer, right? He he built like uh, shop houses and sell mm. and made money out of it. I heard that right now in Malaysia market, shop house is the mm. key. 
Yeah. It's like the growing trend and it's like what people, are, if, if you want to invest, it's, it's the space to look into. Mm. But the high entry, lo. Mm, yeah. The high entry, but to them, nothing went. Yeah, because he's the developer, he uh. built a few. Then I asked him, who do you sell to? How do you market to sell the property? Mm. Then he said, because uh, in his development, he only built like uh, not a lot, yeah. sell a few units. Eh? He said like... he just sell to his friends and family. Yes. <laughs> in Malaysia, right, besides a lot of public holiday, we have a lot of uh, private developers. Yeah. So I look at the latest chart, it's like 2417. 2417? Private developers in Malaysia. So that's good for me yeah. because a lot of projects can be built. La. But that is the main difference also compared to Singapore. Mm. Like Singapore, the government the housing is like major chunk of the market. Ma. Here is different. So in Singapore, right, there's this uh one particular rule or uh, regulations for the developer is that, right, after they build the property, they need to make sure that within uh, the completion, maybe the first don't know how many years, right, they need to sell it off. If it's not sold, the mm. developer will have to face like a uh, tax. Mm. They will be faced with tax. So I'm not too sure about in Malaysia because I see in Malaysia a lot of properties. It seems like there's an oversupply of properties mm. and sometimes the developer has troubles finish selling off the property. Yeah. So uh, I'm not being very critical on this, la, but because I was a developer myself also last time. No, la, I, I worked in a developer firm, not like I built my own houses. <laughs> How I wish no you sit here already. Uh there's this in inconsistent data. We in Malaysia we have this thing called Bumi Kota. Bumi Kota meaning only the Malay friends can buy. Or the indigenous or the orang asli can buy. Some Chinese also orang asli one from Sarawak and Sarawak. So uh the regulation change in accordance to municipal, in accordance to state. So Johor different. Uh, Negeri Sembilan different, Malacca different, every Penang different. In PJ, the highest is 50%. So if I were to build 800 units, right, two blocks, mm -hmm. one whole block is reserved for Bumi. But imagine the cash flow of the developer. Mm -hmm. I need to build all in the same time uh, to hand over. Yeah, yeah. But I cannot sell them because the reality is not as many Bumi buyers out there. Okay. So even, like, not saying that Malay cannot afford, Boomies don't want to buy Boomi lots. They, Is it seen as a less premium? In no, because the design? the exit strategy, you can only sell back to another. Oh, oh shit. Exit strategy is damn important. Yes. So like, they can only sell, sell to, to Boomi, uh, then it limits the, their exit, exit yeah. plan, right? Yeah. So Boomi buyers you don't even want to buy, to buy Boomi. Unit. So some uh boomy buyers they are like when when I buy, can you not categorize me as a boomy or not? Because I want that lot to be an international lot. Is it hard to be a developer in Malaysia also, right? They face a lot of cash flow and selling issues. It's getting harder. Okay. So now government also step in where the cash collected from the financier of the owners, mm -hmm. buyers, mm -hmm. goes into their account first, mm -hmm. while I need to pay my main con to build. Whenever I want to withdraw out, needs to be approved or whatsoever. Because last time, a lot of people built halfway and then lah. Which means they are trying to ensure that the developers in Malaysia has a deep pocket to be able to develop the property uh, first somehow yeah. before they can draw down the money from the financiers. Yeah, yeah. Wow, okay. But that then will create a whole separate thing where it's a monopoly. So Malaysia's developer is so deep top. Like, I really admire their the entire technicality and strategy of development, right? They are so good at money management, so gassy, la, right? A lot of them have their own treasurer. Mm. They are so cash rich. So we can see a lot of developers have their own main con arm. Um, mm. Then they will have their own landscape arm, um, their own infrastructure arm. Um, I see. Then treasurer, then their own shopping mall, their own grocer, their own pharmacies, their own hospital, their own kindergarten. I guess this gives them more uh, control and power over the, the build, the quality, and also in terms of the cash flow and how they want to to make sure that the development is ready. But that's a very political way to say it. Uh. To me, right? <laughs> to me, it's just as a buyer, no more. Yeah, I think Singaporean more can see. Uh, that's why I have to speak like. <laughs> <laughs> that's why, like, we got 
if this is not controlled, right, the, if the regulation of developers is getting higher and higher, now not only you need to build for the people, you need to build for the government. Means, uh, in order for me to win votes, I want to build more affordable houses. Mm, okay. I cannot build myself. Ma. I'm just a minister. Mm. Dear developer, this piece of land you want? I want. Uh, I give you, but you must build uh, 200 units of affordable homes for me. Wow. Along with this project. Okay. But the the price is capped uh -huh. to a certain price. Uh -huh. So I will limit your losses. Okay. Feel free to price into your free market products. Wow. So actually, if I am, I am a normal buyer in Malaysia, I want to buy a property in Malaysia from the developer. I'm kind of overpaying me. Yeah. So that I can, so that the developer or whoever is able to have subsidized houses for other people. Oh, that, God. Then subsidized houses, if it's right to the people who need it, fabulous. Well done, Mr. Minister, right? No. So <laughs> now we have a lot of investors because the selling price is capped, mm -hmm. but the tenants don't care one more. The sub market, the, the tenant market rates is determined by the usage of space, ma. So these people are making a lot, very high ROI. Wow, because they pay very low, but the tenant is paying very high rental. High, high rental, uh, because they need the space to. Wow, that is very good for investors. So I would say, for the rich people, it's a lot of opportunity. Very, and like if cannot sell out, right? Like the project sell fifty percent, left fifty percent, don't know what to do. Mm. Then they, there's this underground deals that we do. Oh uh, my God. You're also very familiar with it, yeah. like, I think. Yeah, so, so like now, well, if you don't sell out, you get penalty, right? For us, it's fine. I hold it in my accounts book, right? As an asset. Eh. That's very good, huh? <laughs> yeah. So if you look into the, the the portfolio of the public listed developers, right? Mm. These are all declared as assets. I think got appreciation somewhat every year. Oh, that's damn cool. Then, okay, let me ask you. Let's say as a Singaporean, because... I think that uh, there's a lot of Singaporeans who do want to buy a property in Malaysia somehow for investment because purely just purely because of the proximity of these two countries, mm. Singapore and Malaysia, right? But I also feel very wary and very scared of in entering into the Malaysian market because there's a lot of scary story. Mm. And also because Singaporean buy into a Malaysia property, you need you can only buy property that is one million dollar ringgit and above. Mm. Which means to say a lot of the more affordable ones that, you know, just now you were talking about, we have no access to them. Mm. So how as a foreigner, if I want to invest in Malaysia property, what would you advise? Would you advise us to forget about it? No. Or are there still some opportunities for us? So my first reply is always this. Uh, Malaysian ringgit versus Sing dollar, right? Mm. Already has a disparity. It means that if you keep all your money in Sing dollar, right? Mm. In 10 years time, right? I would bet my money in Sing dollar. So <laughs> there's an appreciation there. So if you earn a lot of money as a good investor in Malaysia, right, you convert back. What's the point? So I think the intent of investing that becomes very important. A lot of people buy things that they cannot have in Singapore, which is a landed property. So if you buy a landed property here, anything up, like close eye, like you just throw, right? Sure, got one million. Oh, that makes sense. Plus it's free hope. Something that very... Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this thing, Malaysia all take for granted, man. They thought the whole world all give lease uh, free hold. Thailand gives 30 years lease. Myanmar gives 30 years lease. And people still buy. Mm. We all like, oh, non-free. We got 99 years people also complain. Mm. So that being said, if you want to invest in like KL City Center whatsoever, right? The returns currently is comparable to the REITs in Singapore. Mm. Okay. But that comes with a lot of management risk, a lot of tenancy risk or whatsoever. Mm. So some people like to buy trophy. Trophy apartments. Yeah. In Malaysia, then like they come, every time they come here, then I just stay there. They can just cash buy the whole thing. Then it makes sense. Lah. Or if you have old folks here, then you park your money. Then after they leave already, then you cash out again whatsoever. Lah. But as an investment, not really. Lah. Hey, thanks for the advice. So basically to summarize, uh, you are saying that as an investment to really make money because of the currency difference in terms of Singapore dollar generally being very strong, it just doesn't really make currency sense to go into uh, yeah, Malaysia. Yeah. But if we are looking to buy into properties that 
we will never be able to have access to in Singapore, for example, lander, or those very premium high end yeah. project that is very high floor where you can see a very nice skyline building yeah. view, right? Then maybe then we can consider coming in because it's relatively cheaper. That's what you're saying. Yes. Like if you can buy the four season at the HDB price, like. no joke. It makes a lot of sense, huh? Oh, okay, it's, thanks it's, for the advice. LCC, right? Mm. And if you are buying a four season, you won't think about ROI or mm. whatever, right? Yeah. Mm. But even if you hold it as an asset, whether will it appreciate or not, I hope it appreciates. But now it's not as great. Then if you want to run as Airbnb, who's running it for you, all this kind of thing. Mm. They say la, for that few reasons. <laughs> <laughs> but as a Malaysian, different la, like I'm playing for equity. Understand. Right, like, like, like if you're sure you understand how nice if you can just stay around longer. <laughs> <laughs> So after I invest, then I built my equity 35 years, then the, I own the property. Yep. Uh, so that's the game that I'm actually encouraging. If you think about flipping, mm -hmm. that applies to the landed games, the shop officers game, mm. the industrial game. Which actually the uh capital to lay out at the start would usually be higher. Higher, but it's, which is your strongest point as Singaporeans. Mm. 150,000, how much in a year? 30,000. Like. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, nothing. Your holiday trip also cost more than that already. It's still a lot of money, <laughs> ah. Cannot take money as joke. Correct. Mm. But then, like, that's the opportunities where it lays. So, residential-wise, I won't encourage as much okay. as, as much as I hope that you all can steal the market, right? It's for enjoyment purposes, uh, retirement purposes, then, uh, like, especially Binang. If you can get a land. Yeah, recently I saw a YouTube video on this guy interviewing like this couple, Singaporean couple retiring in Penang. They have a ni very nice, beautiful house overseeing the ocean, the sea. That was really yeah. quite a nice video to watch. Yeah. And again, look at the price that's around comparable to a HDB, then mm -hmm. everything else. So you don't have to even think about it. Never need to look at the price on the menu. What do you think of uh, Singaporean building equity in Malaysia? using the property because I rent out and then tenant pay for me at the end of it it's still like a free house that I get at the end of 20 years either I own the house I can move over yep. to Malaysia for retirement or I can sell it off uh, because the yep. principal is paid by tenant yep. How, what do you think of that? Uh, I when I was 17 mm. I was about to buy a property in Genting mm. that property was 17 years old only you start thinking of buying property by that time, uh, in Malaysia, legal age is 18, so I cannot. <laughs> then I was I was quarreling with a lawyer. Can I? My one, two more months. <laughs> Can make me 18. But then my grand aunt bought it, and she's making money of it. Mm. So the whole story is, they, the owners of that block was, major thing was Singaporeans. Mm. When Sing dollar was 80 cents to a dollar ringgit, to a ringgit. Wow. Then it's like how long ago was yeah, that? Yeah, look, very long ago <laughs> la. So like to me, that's how I look at this the currency thing. Right, a lot of if I were to make money off the transactions, I would tell you buy la. Mm. Since it's nothing la. but you think about it, right? Now it's three thirty to a no. So now it's three thirty ringgit to a dollar la. Yeah, yeah. Even you make the building hundred percent full, right? Divide by three, what's that? Yeah, I got it. So basically, in a nutshell, right, as long as like the uh currency gain is going to okay. work this way, it's going to affect the capital appreciation no matter how how strategic you choose the property because Singaporean buy into Malaysia property in in years to come, right, because of currency, no matter how much it appreciates, you will still end up might lose money or yeah. even it's a no-sum game. Yeah. And it just doesn't make sense. Uh, then if, if then if no sum, right, plus all the ma fun. Yeah, and all the scary things that might happen hey, throughout the year. Lao Zhu ye. Hey my god. Yellow so if I'm a Singaporean, like, let's say like if my brother now works there, right, if he really gains a lot, right? Come back buy things that you cannot have. In Singapore. Like a landed villa, let's say three million. So what? Makes a lot of sense. Very good. Hey, I really love the discussion today. So also let's talk about uh, maybe what other things can Malaysians invest on besides Malaysia property? Oh, this, this, is, this is your strength. Like, <laughs> like, why are you guys shifting to UK? 
like you 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 told me in the story so what is it about UK properties? Yeah, so maybe I start off with why, like as Singaporean, we need to start looking outside of Singapore for property investment. Is because, like I mentioned, the tax in Singapore is really getting yeah. very, it's getting high, and I don't think in any near future this cooling measure is going to be taken away. So the ABSD is going to continue to increase. What is ABSD? So? Additional buyer stamp duty, right? It's going to continue to increase. It just doesn't really make sense to pay the government additional money to buy Singapore property. So if Singapore has already owned a property in Singapore, your next plan should be start looking at how you can continue to grow your wealth through property investment, maybe in overseas country, mm. somewhere else. So why am I looking into our UK? It's purely because of the country itself. It has a very, very high demand for property. The mm. demand is so much higher than the supply. In the next few years to come, right, the supply is not going to be able to even hit the demand at all. So what does that mean? It means that rental is going to be very high. So make a guess, uh, what is my occupancy rate in UK? For example, say Manchester or London property. I have no clue. The occupancy rate there at any point in time is roughly about 92%. Wow. 92%, which means every 100 units that are... 92 units are going to be rented out. And the two unit is probably because of time difference, like they are in transition. That's all. So because the demand is so high and there's always a lack of supply, you can be sure that rental game is going to be very strong. And when rental game is going to be strong, you know that appreciation is going to come after that. Yeah, that's why we are very big into uh, UK right now. What's an average time. price of a unit? Uh, generally, you guys won't be surprised if I were to get one there, so I hope. Yeah, it actually <laughs> generally people. Manchester. Okay, generally Manchester property is uh cheaper than London property because London is already very well developed, right? So it's like a, a first world country already. So London very expensive. I would say that if you are a first time uh UK investor and you don't have much capital to start off with, then let's look into Manchester because Manchester is really the second. Biggest uh city it's in terms of economy, right? In uh UK, right? After London. And it's uh, growing and is uh it has an international airport, has a lot of good uh university infrastructure. and infrastructure and a lot of like uh the big companies MNCs are built there, right? So the economy there is very strong and a lot of young people. If we could guess are uh, the average age of the Manchester people, average age right now. My, this is a person who never travels, so I'm a very wrong okay, person. Okay, when I saw the information, I was like damn freaking shocked. The like, okay, if I am living in Manchester, I'm above the average age. That's assuming you are old. <laughs> so right, my point is they are like really young. The average age is probably in the early 30s. Oh, I'm in the mid lah, right? So then they are in the early 30s. So I'm like pulling the average out way if I stay there. So not too nice ah. So no, no, no. Okay, anyways, my point is, so it's a growing city. It's a very young city. And so uh, you were ask me, asking me about roughly what's the price, right? Mm. Manchester. Uh, right now for one bader unit is selling, probably you can find at about 250,000 pounds. 250,000 pounds is how much? Um, I don't know, is it five to six now? Dollars a uh, pound. Two hundred fifty pound is how much ringgit ah? Can you Google it? See, but as yeah, I'm so bad with currencies. Yeah, two hundred fifty pound is maybe about four hundred fifty, four hundred eighty sing. Then that's about maybe one point two, one point at most one point five ringgit lah. One point three ringgit. One point three million. One point three ringgit. Uh, okay, so that's a KL unit also. Eh? Yeah, so, so okay, I repeat that part. So, okay, so for a one-bedroom Manchester unit at the city centre, you probably can get a one-bedroom at about £250,000, which is about 1.3 million ringgit, which is almost equivalent to a KLCC yeah. price, right? Among Kera one. Also. Among Kera one. And make a guess how much you can rent out. 4000 Ringgit. 
Oh, uh, four thousand ringgit. I don't know if don't. four thousand ringgit. Ah, no problem. Okay, in Pau, maybe one bedroom right now, city center can rent out at least ah uh, one thousand four already. It's creeping up. I tell you, like in twenty twenty, when I bought my first UK property, it was completed in the COVID year. My rental was only nine hundred pound, and now is if I renew my lease, is I can fetch probably about one point four. Eh. That is how fast it is growing. One point four pound. Let's say if you don't convert also lah, right? Let's say two fifty pound and you get one point four a month, right? Sixteen thousand four a year, eh? You can almost break even in thirteen years. Yeah, which is pretty good, right? And then and I I also want to address maybe in right now there's also a concern of high interest rate, high interest rate, and uh, it is true lah. The UK interest rate right now is getting high, but the thing about this is all uh, in. UK, there's this thing called interest only loan. That is that in Singapore we don't have. I don't think Malaysia have. Uh, Malaysia have. have the interest only loan for the first five years. Oh, only first five years, right? Eh, hey, very good already. So Singapore don't even have this thing called interest only loan. Okay, so to me, it's like wow, there's interest only loan is perfect because it helps me tie through a high interest rate period, right? So definitely every month. My rental can cover my installment. expenses, my installment. So there is interest only loan in UK, and it can be like the twenty five years, thirty years of interest only loan. Eh. So that's why cash flow is good, in a way, right? And I would say that for property, the only risk that people always are more fearful about is can hold the property or not, because property can appreciate if you choose the right place, right? But the question is, can you wait until it appreciate to win the money? Right, so which means the holding power is very important. So how do you make sure that you have a strong holding power for a property? Is to make sure that you invest in a place whereby the rental is the rental game is very strong. Yes. Then you have holding power and wait until capital appreciation. You either refinance or sell. Yes, money come in again. Okay. Plus, it's also attractive to new batch of investors. Exactly. That's why there's always demand for yeah. high rental things. Everybody is looking for ROI. One. The problem of the rich right now is they got nowhere to put their money ma. yeah right. I will say so and I just now was hearing you talk about like it probably as a Malaysian yeah. you guys might be also concerned about the depreciation of your currency against the world mm-hmm. then that's why I feel that for me uh, actually UK property could be a good option for Malaysians right to start to explore to think about how you want to preserve your wealth and whatever savings that you have uh, by investing your money in UK in yeah. the pound and then you store the value as a pound rather than um, yeah. in gain. X. Actually, I do not I do not categorize as all Malaysians. I categorize as the average Malaysian. Yeah. <laughs> because a lot of like when I went to Kuching, when I went to Sabah, right? Mm. A lot of them actually buys property in Australia and UK. Yeah. A lot because they have no faith in our government. I'm like, you sure, but they still buy. Mm. So, <laughs> so like, this is has this has always been a game, especially when they have kids. Mm. They buy where the universities are. Yeah. They buy first. So, until my kid grow up, like, your kid, like, go away now. Like, mm. five years old only. Ah, yeah, I went out first like, until they need it. Then they yeah. move in with their housemate. Then they collect rental from their parents, like, whatever. Then, yeah. It makes a lot of sense because then the by then right the property price really would have already appreciated and throughout the whole period that you're holding it is rented out, tenant is paying for you, then it's a show win. You are kind of owning the house without any putting in more money. That's what I feel. So that's why right now I'm very big in UK. As for Australia, because the tax is actually very high and also the exit plan for Australia property, yeah. you can only sell it to the local. So uh it could could limit your yeah. exit plan that's why uh, I'm not too into Australia yeah. right now yeah. at this yeah. moment in time yeah but a lot of people just buy houses so their whole family migrate there yeah I think like you mentioned just now is with what intention are you buying the property for yeah. because that's very important is it for own stay or uh, with the intention of children studying there with the intention of migrating there or is it with the intention of just purely for investment because this will determine why are you even buying what kind of properties mm. But then the main concern like a normal person would have is management how? Hey, management so easy. Just find a good reputable management company to do it for you. Lor. Of course they charge a fee la. But uh 
uh, you really hands off. Uh. I mean, as of now, uh, I have tried like a management company that is not good until I come to pick one that I feel very reliable, that is very good. So I could recommend uh, if uh, anybody needs that. But uh, you're right, finding a very reputable, trustworthy, dependable management company to help you manage your property, especially when it's like half the globe away, is quite important. Yeah. It is very important, yeah. <laughs> the fact that I have properties in JB mm. also cannot say <laughs> that. I came out of JB or so, I, oh my god, my, uh, my icon leaking. I you need to call this person, call that person. Hey, but I must tell you, uh, uh, I have seen like the quality of the build of mm. my own unit by the developer in the UK that I bought from. The, the, the quality of the build is super premium. Eh? Mm. It doesn't look like it will spoil any single time easily. The shelving, the furnishing, and the ceiling and whatnot, everything is very premium and well made. So I feel that same thing like what you mentioned, or like in Singapore, if I want to get to that kind of quality, I really need to pay a lot of money. I don't think I can afford like Singapore, but then I can afford to buy it overseas right now in say Manchester. But then like coming back to Singapore, right? The when I mean, you buy private projects like condominiums, what's the I I heard stories where a lot of my friends' parents, which is weird, I always go hang out at friends' party, I speak to their parents. <laughs> you got old soul, is it old soul? Yeah, no. <laughs> obsessed about money. Then they call or compa- complain to me about their Singapore project all lose money because they all can buy private only. They cannot buy HDB. Ma. So how true is that statement? I am not sure. Maybe your friend, are they like a Singapore citizen when they buy the parents? Maybe they're all as expats. As expats, right? Expats? Like a foreigner? Foreigner. Eh, then what? Jialat. Because as a foreigner, you buy a property in Singapore, the tax uh, mm. is I think 30 plus percent. Eh? Yep. Additional tax. Eh? Mm. Then of course, if you already pay the additional tax, then you imagine you, okay, for example, you pay additional 30 percent tax. Another, your neighbor is a Singaporean, no need to pay the additional tax. And when the property price appreciate, people appreciate 30%, they meet the 30%, you appreciate 30%, you still don't make money, haven't even break even. That is why I think it's difficult for a foreigner buying a property in Singapore, right, to really uh, make money. But then again, I do have a lot of faith in the uh, property scene in Singapore because generally Singapore really lack of uh, supply, la. The land is so small and the government want to build yeah. the population very big, right? So over time, generally, property price should still always go upward trend. But uh, as a foreigner investing, because of your tax, the yeah. amount that you're being taxed, right? Naturally, you will expect that uh, it's very hard for them to be profitable in it. And I guess the government put it this way is so that foreigners don't come in to make money out of the residential yeah. market and then they drive the price up too high for the locals. So that's why the foreigners are more heavily taxed. I guess that's, that's the reason. But what's amazing is after so many cooling measures, right, being imposed, right, it's still out of control. Yeah, I don't know why that <laughs> Singaporean, like everybody like so rich like this. I also don't know how come like everybody seems to have a lot of money to keep buying, to mm. buy, right, or to, to drive the price up. I'm, I'm also not too sure. I'm also very perplexed by this, mm. even with the cooling measures, uh, the the prices are still going up. But then I must say that uh, from last year to this year, because of the layers of cooling measures and the interest rate, I do think that the Singapore residential market is slowing down a little bit compared to uh, in year 2021 after COVID. After COVID, everything just went up crazy. After up. COVID, like, everyone, everything is like, free. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know how come. <laughs> Maybe you all don't travel as much anymore la, because cannot travel. La. Because Singaporean, your with your currency, you travel anywhere also cheap one. That's what my brother tell me, is that because they travel every year, they're like, "Wow, you all no money, no lah." Sing dollar strong. Generally, Sing dollar is quite strong. I just went to Japan last year, November. Eh, then yen just now at that point that is like uh quite low. Wow, yeah. Sure. Yeah, shook ah. <laughs> Happy yeah. But now, okay, now uh, let's get a little bit more personal, right? It's very rare to meet a lady like besides Rina right there's another friend that's Rina another lady that speaks the language that I speak it's very hard to find a man that speaks the same language really 
won't mm-hmm. even rare lah. Yeah. Right. So like, how is your up? bringing like like how do you know when you are so inclined with numbers la investment where is a general statement that is more of a man thing wow eh, eh, um how to answer this uh, uh upbringing like definitely my upbringing is not from a space whereby my parents are property investor or owners in fact we were so damn poor mm. right so poor and i remember when i was young okay my parents upgrade from a four-room hdb to a five-room hdb and at that point in time, everybody very happy, right? Hey, upgrade to a bigger house right now. And what happened was after that, my parents like chicken rice business not, was not doing well. And uh, because four room HDB to five room HDB, of course, their monthly mortgage and uh, liability is now higher and they feel more stress. Hey, then plus the business not doing well, owning money for the business. And then plus now we have a bigger mortgage to pay off, right? I think at that point in time, my family was facing a lot of stress with regards to money and with regards to paying the mortgage for the house. It's really very stressful. I tell you, my family has electricity cut off a few times. Right? So no electricity stay in the house. I see big sure. I have uh, two other siblings, the uh, elder brother and the elder sister, right? So that was me at that point in time. And I still remember very clearly, there was some, and I was really young, like primary school kind of age and maybe secondary school later on. I still tell my parents, like, hey, you know what? Like, if we cannot afford to stay in this bigger house, like five room HDB, why don't we just downgrade? Mm-hmm. Just downgrade and, you know, move on. Uh. So since yeah, I already have this idea, oh my gosh, the mortgage is so scary. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, have to pay the mortgage. And uh, if you cannot afford to pay for the house, it, it can be very stressful, right, for the family. But my parents, especially my mom, insisted that, uh, no, we have to keep the house because the house is like a forced saving. I don't understand what she was talking about, but I'm like thinking, gosh, you are paying money to the bank or to the government every month. What do you mean by the house is a forced saving, right? So at a point in time, I didn't understand. But of course, uh, as years goes by, my brother and sister started working and then the, uh, the a monthly commitment for my parents is getting be- lesser, yeah, yeah. so it's, it's better for them. And then when my pa- brother and sister moved out of the house, when they got married, my parents started to rent out some of the rooms because mm-hmm. now it's a five-room, right? Hey, we have four bedrooms and then could rent out one or two of the bedrooms and start getting income, you know. Mm-hmm. Then I start to see, hey, oh my gosh, hey, property investment is the way to go. Buying pro- or, or rather, buying property is a very important like a well, safety please. net. For my parents, even though they are like poor, you know, we were poor and not even earning a lot of money and they are not educated. Mm. But just because my mom believes in holding on to the property, she tied through the difficult time mm. and she hold on to the property. Then later on in her life right now, she, she still has the same house and she could rent out the uh, rooms for her retirement. So, I mean, over time, I just see that, hey, you know, actually property investment is very important. Own, or rather owning a house Owning your own property is very important. And that is how I kick-started this uh, learning about property investment journey mm. and dive deeper into this rabbit hole to find out more. Then your yeah. first property story, which is the name of the podcast, for your information. <laughs> My first property story. Like, how's your... At what age you bought and what kind of property you bought? Hey, not like you, uh, the first property at 17. Or no, no, no. First you know, that, one, that, one, that one didn't happen. So I bought mine at late 22. That is also still damn young. Ah, okay. This Let's talk about... Okay. <laughs> no, not competition, but then like... Uh, okay, so when did I buy my first property? I bought my first property when I was 30 years old. Okay. Okay, so let me explain why. Uh, Because at that point in time, right, to buy... At that point in time, right, my knowledge of buying property is only limited to buying Singapore residential property. Nobody would go and think about commercial or overseas property at that point in time. I just thought like, in my first property, I need to own a Singapore residential property. Okay, now in Singapore, in order for you to own a government property, you need to get married, right? And obviously, I wasn't married at that point in time, so I cannot buy HDB. So I can only buy private property and naturally the private property prices is higher. The down payment is more. How much more? At that point in time, HDB down payment is 10%. Private property down payment at that point in time was 20%. So it's like double more. So, and remember I could pay using my CPF. So I need to wait until I work for sufficient number of years to build up that CPF. And I have sufficient cash to pay for the down payment for my first property. 
then yeah then the rest is history that's how i got my first property then later on uh, sell it off flip it and buy into the next and subsequent one and grow my portfolio from there though. how many countries of properties you have uh, is it, is it can, a to ask? it's a good question to ask because i've made mistakes as well uh three right now on uh, singapore and uh uk and i bought into a cambodia property before hey don't laugh ah. <laughs> no okay. no my G's are there. <laughs> okay why cambodia property that is like uh, yeah before i know enough about i uh, property that i didn't know better about leverage and loan don't know what is the meaning and difference between good debt, bad debt, and always think that, ha, ah, payful, can, ah, guarantee return scheme, good, ah, no need to pay any more money, the, the property can just, uh, bring me passive income, so, uh, that was when I didn't know much about how to really pro- properly invest in property through leverage to, you know, have a multiplier effect, then I got sold by the guarantee return scheme, and, yeah, mistake made and lesson learned. Yeah, GRR. Okay, there's a whole story that I make about this. GRR. And I received some fire on it after the video went out, which is good. So this is so cool. Like, what's next for you? What's next for me? Like, like, like. okay, this is a question that I like to ask a lot of uh, serial property investors. Okay. Like, like, my goal is up to 25 properties, mm-hmm. right? So now almost halfway. But then still still trying very hard la. Mm-hmm. But then like ultimately my concern is like uh no matter how I build, right? Then my brother in Singapore, Chin Chai, buy one HD sell upgrade, sell upgrade, right? Convert back, right? Net worth the same. The net worth is still uh same or probably faster than you if he just take even lesser move, right? Yeah. Then I'm like, what why am I doing all this? But yeah, you know, because I love Malaysia, excuse. But then like mm-hmm. So, the UK one, we can talk off cam later, but what's your next? Okay, so what's my next move is, of course, uh, okay, a few next move. Uh. My next move is, I have some industrial property in Singapore, and they have already profited. I'm just waiting for the time up uh, for me to sell them off. I just recently sold one of my industrial property that I bought three years ago, and then with the new money that I have, I'll be pay- buying more properties so where i'll be looking for is uh firstly continue to explore good opportunities in uk that's number one right because i have already experienced the goodness of it because the tenant mm. is ongoing it's very hard to have no tenant in your unit in uk so that's number one for uk uh secondly uh i think i think uh i was i have already been investing in safer properties right now like Singapore property UK properties and build a sufficient portfolio for myself to continue to let it roll right now I am actually looking for slightly something different like which is to explore into the space of doing more maybe Airbnb kind of things that means running yeah more exotic things maybe I guess the higher risk higher return so I am also like trying to explore whether I can uh, tap into say prop running property as a business in terms of say Airbnb rather than just from a investor pr- perspective to see whether I can make a business better return out of it so want to explore Airbnb maybe in say Bali Villa or something like that mm. this is also a finding again my context is always in Malaysia and you know, this little potato right um, a lot of uh, landed homes in PJ like those three whole ones right never modify whatsoever the price nobody's gonna pay like let's say like they bought last time maybe three hundred thousand now it's like three million four million right. They don't know what to do with it. They cannot exceed it. So then if you find a way and if you pass to their offspring, they also don't know what to do with it. So if you look into the listing of Airbnb, actually a lot of party places throughout the weekends are hosted there. Ooh, so people rent and sublet, rent it and run it, run Airbnb, run business out of it. Hey, very good idea. So so that day, like, this happened to my like Chinese New Year, then they are, my wife's friend got gathering there. Mm. Then I'm staying in a person's corner lot uh, house. Mm. 
So corner lot house like normal lah, but then in that corner lot house got like six bedrooms of the modified, which can host like fifteen twenty people. Mm. Then per night is like two thousand five. Mm. And my friend just without hesitation pay because we got twenty people, ma. What person? Yeah, yeah, yeah. worth like, it. Oh, so then I'm like, okay, this house I look, <laughs> it's not that expensive for me. Yeah, then yeah, yeah. in those like exotic places, so like and exotic places in internationally is it means higher price. But in Malaysia, it means the other way. It's like those kampong kampong where it's closer to the plantation, it's closer to the river or what. Nice scene, nice surrounding. Okay. Not landslide areas. Don't worry. <laughs> then, like these kind of places, then becomes very attractive, leh, which is like very interesting to bounce off, right? The to run property as a business, mm. that's something that. Also, I'm thinking of lah. But after I settled this one, where yeah, I just got one last week, so after that one, then try to then we have the one hundred percent loan kind of thing. Mm-hmm. If you know how to play lah, yeah. So if you got no not enough money, you buy property. Then suddenly you got cash, right? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Then we use the cash to go and buy all this. Yeah. Yeah. It is a uh, explore further. I think it's a very interesting topic because I think a lot of people actually do make even more money. Uh, by running a business out of property, while in just purely investing is a good game because during the investment actually there's nothing you do like, while the tenant is staying in it actually is a very boring game uh, right? So, uh, but running it as a business will be different because it means you are very hands on. You need to make sure that hey, your photo is nice. Which- want to stay there and how do you strategically price your property for the rental for the night and how you stage out the place so that it's attractive for people I think that's a very very fun for me uh. and post pandemic right traveling is a big thing everybody just can't wait to spend their money yeah we didn't need to tap on that well uh, if okay so any last words of advice for a person let's say working in Singapore or working in Malaysia mm. and let's say if you have you can speak to your 25 or 28 year old person version of you what, what advice would you give? I think the advice is very simple like uh, don't spend too much money on things that you don't need now like delayed gratification is very important save your first pot of money and get into your um, game of property ownership first because I have seen so many of the people that I met uh they, they, their life change uh, and wealth change just purely because they did just one right move and then three years later they can sell and make money out of it and then they have a bigger pot of money and their life trajectory just changed from there. So don't just, um, don't, don't underestimate uh, that just one right move, one right decision to just kickstart your property ownership journey. Enough said. <laughs> uh, yeah but again in part of I think this is a, since we are two de- different demographics right, just to end the conversation is about the governance mm. right so uh, in Singapore I think Chin Chai Tro it's old, very safe right? I if, say in Malaysia it's not because we have 2000 over <laughs> developers in so many places yeah. not every kampong will make money okay mm. And that also means that we have a lot more opportunities to play the game. Yours is a very textbook. Mm. Ours is not. Mm. Ours you can. Anything also can. Right? Mm. If you know how to do it. So uh, that's my version of the Malaysian one compared to Singapore one. So very cool to have you again. So I hope that uh, like we spoke, if I get to go uh, to your property in UK to review, right? Since I'm going Singapore already, like since and if I can stop by UK, then go Australia. I'm going in April. You want to come with us? I'm serious. Let's talk about off camp, off camp, off camp, off camp. And I, I think that's all for today. Uh, so if people want to ask you things or reach out to you about UK investment, I will put the link down below, lah. Okay, lah. You just uh can text me on my IG. I think that is simple. I will try to reply. Or your email do you like work in it? Uh, well, so. Not really. My staff will always like tell me, hey, you need to check your email. <laughs> I'm more on WhatsApp lah, so IG will be better. Yeah, okay. IG you can somehow control because later people swarm you with. Yeah, let's not do that. Okay. So uh see you guys on the next one. Thank you so much for coming and 
uh, do listen, do, do the same thing, share, like, comment. Bye.